next, let's talk about some teeth. Um, up next, we have um, joining us via live stream, um, doc Drs. G Jetter, Warner, and Dr. Frey um, to talk about oral health. They're from the University of Texas, Houston. Dr. Frey joined us um, the, at our last family conference and was really wonderful. And he's brought in some of his amazing team to talk about oral health. So welcome the doctors from the University of Texas, Houston to talk about dental health. Hello, it's a pleasure to be with you from Texas. And I would like to introduce Dr. Cameron Jeter. I can see her picture there. And I really enjoyed Keith's enthusiasm about therapeutic recreation. And I want you to be enthusiastic about teeth. It's really hard to do a presentation streaming like this. Uh, unfortunately, this spring I was diagnosed with cancer and I have to stay in Texas to do treatment. Otherwise I would have been there with you. My sister is in Colorado and my cousins are in Boulder and I would have loved to have gone up there. So anyway, I wanted to share with you a little bit about teeth because families, can, uh, you know, some families say, hey, we've got this figured out, but most families say it's a challenge. And depending on people's ability to re receive language and express language, sometimes the dental situation can be very stressful. Uh, I needed to say that my, I teach at the University of Texas School of Dentistry in Houston. We're in the medical center, largest medical center in the world. I also teach at Baylor College of Medicine at the UT McGovern School of Medicine. So we've, we've got a collaborative uh, educational thing there and everything we say today is our specific opinions. We don't have any financial relationships with any commercial entities. So when you see a slide about a mouthwash or something, we're not promoting that, it's an example but we certainly don't want you to take anything that we talk about in this course as advice, specific advice to care for a specific person. So I'm required to give that by my school. Uh, we call ourselves a mosaic team and that's because we're a lot of different parts, moving parts across medical and dental, AADMD, uh, mosaic volunteers. We have a lot of organizational abilities uh, down in Houston. And so we're gonna be sharing a little bit about that. Dr. Jeter is a part of our team. Uh, there are a lot of different people that together we're trying to change healthcare. And I think you're gonna already see if you haven't already a different approach among dentists and there's reasons behind it, I'll talk about it, but things are changing. So the learning objectives are, and you can have a copy of this presentation. It really is, you know, when is dental disease important and what do we do about behavior and is there, is there a different way or maybe a way that we can do something uh, that works better? I'd like for you to understand that this is the vicious circle that we've seen for years. People get started, they try to make things work, things don't work, usually there's an emergency, procedure gets aborted and then the family says, you know, maybe the different dentist might be better. And so when you talk to families, we surveyed over a thousand families at the Baylor uh, Transitional Medical Clinic in Houston uh, three years ago, and we found out that more than half had, had actually tried it to five different dentists. And uh, that's not what we like to see, but I think that that's what happens. And a lot of times families just give up and give up for 10 years until they have a dental crisis. So we want to, we want to change this. So what are some of the reasons that this happens and what can we do about it? Uh, we need to know as families, what's important to do daily. I have a a cousin with an adult child that's from 30 with autism. My dad had disability, was deaf. I've been involved in the disability community my whole life. Uh, but, you know, nobody gives us a manual and it's hard to figure out. You'd have to try to find out, well, what is important? What do I need to do today? Uh, the dental office needs to adapt to people with intellectual developmental disability, as opposed to expecting people with disabilities to adapt to the dental office. That is a concept that families get, but dentists don't and we have to help them to understand why maybe there's a better way. Uh, we need to know when something's a problem. We need to know how to, how to pay for things. And we need to find out when not to pay for something. I think that's a big challenge too. And then how do you find a dentist that really understands all this? And when is dentistry in my home better? So these are some of the things that we have to answer, the questions we have to, and that's why it's hard. So what is it about behavior? Well, it's, it's very unique to the person. The question is, can it be easier? And I would say more than half the time it can't. There are times sometimes that it takes years to figure behavior out. Families need to use behavioral therapists. Dental teams need to understand behavior and be a part of an overall team. 
and understand the behavior is not stuck. It's not static. It's, it's just what it is today because it's communication today. We all need to relearn a different approach and families and dental teams are allies. And I, that's really what we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to shift it over because we've been doing a mosaic project over at the Baylor Medical School for the last three years. And before I get into the boot camp part, because boot camp is about trying to instill passion and understanding both uh, about dentistry today, I wanted you to hear from Dr. Jeter. Dr. Cameron Jeter uh, is a, I think you have her bio, but she she's a, a neurobehavioralist. And so she's got her PhD and she teaches both with our medical and dental students. And she's been a I think a, a very invaluable member of our Mosaic team, Dr. Jeter. Thank you, Dr. Frey, and hello to you all. I appreciate your time. And what I wanna visit with you about is how to acclimate your loved one into the dental office, and likewise, a bit about how to acclimate the dental team uh, to provide care for your loved one. And so just like any of us, who may be a little nervous about going into an unfamiliar situation. Uh, let's say you're even going to attend the worship service of someone from a different faith. You don't know what to wear or whether you'll sing or how long the service is. So too with dental care, uh, people who have not experienced it before don't quite know what the unfamiliar sights, sounds and smells will bring. So, we want to help prepare the individual with IDD for the dentist in the way that they best communicate, whether that's a verbal explanation of what's to come, whether it's showing the person what will, they will experience during the appointment. And all the while we wanna make this fun, turning everything into a game and allowing uh, the future patient uh, as they acclimate to realize that this is a fun and fulfilling experience. So on the next slide, we'll go on and talk about some of that methodology. The first is called modeling. And this means observing a peer who is going through the very experience or behavior that the observer will be expected to do in short order. So as the picture shows at the bottom, uh, uh, one friend laying as if he's in the dental chair and another providing care. And we're the onlookers. We're the ones seeing other people model. We can do this at any age and with any family member or friend, for example, having a scavenger hunt in your own home first uh, to go find the toothpaste or the toothbrush and to look in the mirror and to see your own teeth, maybe to recline in a chair at home or watch others do this. And these field trips can extend to the dental office with a dental provider uh, who is willing to offer that. Have a scavenger hunt at the dental office where you hunt around for things that will be involved in the dental appointment, like the light that shines in our face or the position of the x-ray tube. This can be done often on the weekends when the practice is closed. Another method uh, after modeling is role playing. And this is a bit more involving the participation of the observer. So now they are an individual who participates and these cute little kids in the photo are showing how they've ensured that they have uh, the um, sunglasses to protect the patient's eyes from the bright light and the protective um, blankets that they wear to protect against the x-rays for the radiographs. In this way, it's practice and becoming familiar with the tools, even if they're pretend tools, so you can take your time and have fun in doing this. One um, goal that we're going for is called desensitization. So we know that often senses in our environment, like loud noises during gym class, uh, can disturb uh, our family members uh, who have intellectual and developmental uh, disabilities. Through the process of desensitization, we have them grow accustomed to these strange stimuli in their environment either by relaxation training, teaching them to breathe deeply and to progressively relax muscles. For example, starting with our head, then relaxing muscles of the neck and the shoulders, working down the body to remain calm. And through visual exposure, showing our loved one 
what uh, stimuli will be in the environment uh, for the dental treatment. Looking at the strange dental chair, maybe even playing with how it inclines or reclines, again, that scavenger hunt. And other stimuli, bright lights or the auditory exposures, hearing the drill, and don't forget the smells that can occur in the dental office. Through this way, we are gathering experience together and desensitizing from the stimuli that may bother us. So positive reinforcement can be as simple as saying, good job, wonderful, that's it, you've got it. This is natural that we give to each other and we want to ensure that we provide positive reinforcement to our loved one. If you think about it, how often are we saying the reverse? No, don't run, put that down, be quiet. The opposite in positive reinforcement can stand out as a reward and will reinforce the behavior that just happened previously. Now remember that while verbal um, reinforcement is positive, not all food can be positive. For example, candy uh, is counter to the oral health that we're trying to achieve in the first place. So we want to use favorite things of our loved one as positive reinforcement that we give directly after their successful behavior. So to summarize these behavioral strategies, we want to help the individual experience the environment incrementally, to establish relationships incrementally, and we can talk about inviting dental providers, uh, the assistants into the home to meet them first, all the while being respectful of everyone's personal space because dental treatment requires being in your face intrinsically. We want to engage the person to participate in the entire process through modeling and participating and to help understand uh, the psychological concepts of ABC behavior. What is this? A is the antecedent or the trigger for B, the behavior that communicates either pleasure or displeasure and C, the consequence that we return. And so in this way, the antecedent, which is what happened just before the target behavior we want to either reinforce or to diminish, can be followed by a consequence. This is either that positive reinforcement, handing over a toy, uh, rewarding with uh, behavior or an opportunity that they like. So through these support techniques, we're building a level of trust between our loved one and whoever will be providing and supporting oral health care. It's helpful to have on hand social stories. This might be um, what to do when I'm fearful or what to expect at the dentist. These involve pictures so that we can communicate non-verbally what to expect. And this helps us practice the environment and the routine that we'll encounter in the dental office. Remember that nonverbal communication is key and helpful, and that even as young children are playing on the floor or sitting in the dental chair, we too can get on the floor, even in the dental office, to talk to them to be lower and respectful of the kid in the chair. Communicate in all different ways, verbally, emotionally, and physically, so the entire message received is that the patient is valued. We want to use a variety of behavior practices at home. Desensitization, as I talked about, is learning not to be worried by the stimuli involved in, for example, oral hygiene. So we get to play with a dental mirror and a toothbrush and a brush bright from um, different companies that we can talk about allow the individual to help by holding a mirror or putting on gloves, just as they'll see of the dentist, all the while using that positive reinforcement. If need be, uh, you can also use distraction as a tool to draw attention away from stimuli that you think will be bothersome. Don't be discouraged if you feel that an exercise of practice wasn't successful on a given day. You're always going for fun and practice never force it. Practice makes perfect. And I'll conclude by just giving a highlight of a brush and bite starter kit, an example kit that you can use at home to help your loved one grow used to some of the tools that they'll see in the dental office. 
So thank you and I'll turn it. Uh, oh, well, let me go on. I guess I have maybe two more slides. So when you're looking at the ABCs, the antecedent, the behavior and the consequence, identify the behavior that you want targeted. Are they screaming or turning in circles or not opening the mouth? This is a behavior that you can target by first seeing what is the antecedent or what comes before this desired or undesired behavior. And what can I do immediately after that behavior to target and encourage more of good behaviors and less of undesired behaviors. So remember differential reinforcement means encouraging only those behaviors that are appropriate in the situation. And you can do this with a variety and small increments of reinforcers so that your loved one never goes, grows tired of that positive reinforcement. Again, praise and positive feedback is uh, trumps all others. And the advantages of this is it's free and ubiquitous. It can be used in many ways be enthusiastic uh, in loving personal touch and verbal reinforcement. Your dental team, you can interview them and encourage them to do modifications to help in this process, changing the stimuli in the environment like lighting, sounds, tastes, and as we emphasized at the beginning, a scavenger hunt to help your loved one grow accustomed to that specific dental office. The American Academy for Pediatric Dentistry has identified six different ways that we can encourage the desired behavior from varying the um, tone or the speed of our voice, also having nonverbal communication like facial expressions and physical touch, tell, show, do that first tells the individual what process will be done, showing them how to do it, and then performing it with them or on them positive reinforcement with verbal encouragement, distracting from adversive stimuli, and then deciding whether it's best for your loved one, whether the parent is present or absent from the procedure. So I thank you. I'll turn it now over to Dr. Frey, who will talk about some helpful products in the oral hygiene uh, routines at home. So this is a good thing you can get fairly cheaply at Specialized Care Company. It's a DVD that you can share with caregivers. So if you have people that provide care to your child, specifically like an adult child, when your child is not in your home, this is a good way to make sure that they know how to, how to uh, keep clean, teeth clean. The triple brush that I showed earlier, they, they sell one called a surround brush here. It's just kind of the same concept, different company. And then uh, being able to use a mouth rest. And I really, really like the open wide mouth rest. You stick it in sideways where it's thin, and then you gradually get people used to opening a little wider. This is something you would practice with at home with toothbrushing and then take to the office. And then when the dentist uses it, the person's already familiar with it. So this is, I really like this. These are really good to use and they're cheap. Uh, the D-Determined program, this is Dr. David Tassini out of Florida. Uh, he, I've known him for 20 or 30 years through Special Olympics. And uh he basically takes applied behavioral analysis is what this is. And he just says, you know, there's ways that we can get people kind of used to the dental office. Uh, I do so, I, I'm preaching a, a concept called incremental model, which takes it a little bit further and basically uses families as allies. And we actually start way before the dental office. That's the whole concept is that there's a better way to do this. Uh, some people have a hard time with grasping a toothbrush. So the question is, do you want to brush teeth or you don't want the individual to brush teeth? And the answer is you want the individual to brush teeth, but you also want to make sure the teeth are, are clean. And so whatever it takes to get to that, never give up on people's ability to learn how to brush teeth. And I would tell you the little sponge on the right is worthless. And that's what you typically see in a lot of institutional settings because they're cheaper. And so if, you, if somebody's using one of those little pink sponges on the right or something like that, throw it away. But you can modify the grip on a toothbrush in lots of ways. You can make it to where people can hold them. Uh, people that have contractures, you can actually fold them where they can be uh, the, the second from the left, the green one. Uh, the bicycle handlebar is a good thing. Uh, I like uh, Interplaque is one. There's probably five or six really good uh, electric toothbrushes that also spray water. And those are very effective. Unless you have a person that has a swallowing disorder or tooth bed then the water spray is a problem. If that happens, what you do is you turn a person sideways 
and you make sure you use gravity so that the water doesn't go to the back of the throat. So a lot of times people ask the question about, well, how much toothpaste is enough? And what I'm telling you is you really don't need very much, okay? So if you look at the pea size on the right, that's, that's about right. That's what you wanna do. When you look at the TV commercials, they put a lot of toothpaste on there. If you use less toothpaste, people will be more cooperative. They won't swallow fluoride and you'll actually save money over a long period of time that you won't waste toothpaste. So I think that's helpful. That's me, man. I hear somebody that needs to mute their mic, I think. So about brushing, how much and when? Well, we want to start early. And you want to get, to, you want to get children used to a toothbrush very early. But you have people who are teenagers or adults, and this has never worked. And so the way they're going to have to relearn that behavior is very incrementally. And it only can be relearned uh, as it's fun. But if you start with an infant, it actually it makes it a lot easier. So when children are small, this is a really good way to brush teeth. Brush them from behind. You can see better, do a better job. In addition, with infants, we have a knee-to-knee a -knee approach. And this can actually be done by a pediatric dentist and use the parent, and that's what this is. But it can also be modeled at home before the child ever gets to the dentist. So the knee-to-knee -knee approach helps because the parent trusts us there. And, you know, there was an earlier slide about whether the parent should be in the office. And my belief is the parent should always be able to see what's going on. And so that can be done in multiple ways. I used to leave the door cracked. Uh, I would, or sometimes I would have the parent in the room, but behind the line of view of the child so that the child wouldn't triangulate and look at me and then the parent and me and the parent, because then they're trying to decide, well, who, who's in charge? But I think the parent in the room is, is best and the parent being available uh, because you know your child better than the dentist. And that's my personal view. Some dentists don't feel that way, but I, I really think the parents are the key. Uh, learning to floss is something people have a large, a big time a problem with. And these floss holders, it's difficult to wrap the floss around the tooth 180 degrees, so they're not quite as effective, but boy, they are really easy to play with. And uh, if you get colorful ones, sometimes you can get individuals very used to them. So I think they're, they're very helpful to at least to be a starter. I'd say most adults don't know how to floss and that's not uncommon. And they, or they'll floss front teeth, but not back teeth very well. But floss is important because it's one way to get teeth clean between teeth where a toothbrush cannot go. Uh, caries uh, prevention, caries is the word we use for cavities. Really important for us to prevent rather than wait too late. The type that you use really doesn't matter as long as it's got the ADA seal on the back of it. Uh, so you look here on this slide, the ADA seal looks like right here on this mouthwash. Uh, any mouthwash that you use should have fluoride and not alcohol. So that would be what you want to look for in a mouthwash. How often should you move, use mouthwash? I would get people used to, if they're able to rinse and spit and not swallow, that's a big if, I would have them use it morning, and at noon and in the evening. Uh, they can make, you get these real small bottles of mouthwash, people can take them with them wherever they are at noon. That's a real good substitute when you can't get access to go brush teeth. And so you should brush every time you've got something in your mouth, but if you can't, the mouthwash is very effective. So uh, this is a different type of, of toothpaste. It's very strong with fluoride. This needs to be uh, prescribed. And again, I wanna emphasize if a person does not rinse and spit completely, if they're not able to spit this out, then they're gonna be swallowing fluoride. Fluoride is your friend, it's healthy, it's found naturally in, in, in the oceans. It's just like salt, we can't, we, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a part of our environment, but too much salt, too much anything, it's probably not good. And we know that if you swallow a lot of toothpaste, especially as a child, you're gonna have some fluorosis on your teeth and that's, what, that's what's not good. Fluoride does not cause cancer. I think that's something that you can find on the internet. So there, it, it's really, I like to tell people fluoride is your friend and understand that, you know, it's not, it's not too much of it can be too much. So make sure you're using it appropriately. This is what fluorosis looks like. These are the white splotchy things. They're usually found on the tips of, of anterior teeth. This is clearly the teeth of a child that had a little bit too much toothpaste and probably swallowed toothpaste. 
you cannot swallow too much fluoride in the water because it's only one to a million parts. So you can't get fluorosis from swallowing properly treated fluoride. Fluoride occurs like out in Colorado, parts of Colorado, fluoride occurs naturally at 10 parts per million, and that does cause fluorosis. So you can get too much in the natural water, but fluoridated water that in most uh, localities that don't have fluoride in their water needs to be one part per million, and it's, it is safe, and it doesn't, it doesn't damage teeth like this. The other thing is fluoridated water doesn't do anything for adults. It only really helps you while your enamel is forming. Uh, there's other types of fluoride. The one on the left, Advantage Arrest, is the most common in the United States. Uh, some of these others are found in other countries. And uh, the one on the upper right, the blue one, is found in Japan. This is not something that you would use at home. Families wouldn't use it, but this is something that might be used by a dentist. And so this would be a situation where you have a cavity, and you can see right here, and these are baby teeth, and then they put a little drop of silver diamine fluoride in there, and the cavity turned black. Well, what does that mean? That means that the bacteria that actually was causing the decay was just, was just exterminated. So this is a very good thing to use, um, especially early on when maybe you, can't, you don't have the time or the patient's not cooperative. So it takes only a second to apply it to the tooth. You might have to apply it uh, two, three times, two weeks apart in order to completely kill the cavity. It doesn't make it look better but it certainly stops it from getting worse, okay? So this is another example of how it's... Are you guys still able to see me? Yes, we can, sir. You're back okay. now. Okay. All right. Something happened there. Uh, most universal disease. We, people uh, don't sir, realize we, it. Yes. Uh, doctor, if you could reshare your screen. Okay. Okay. Now can you see it? And we're just waiting for that to come up. It looks like it's coming up here. Yes, we have it. Everything looks great. Yeah, I don't know what happened. We just kind of lost the sharing of the screen. So what is caries? It's just the word we use for cavities. The thing to remember is that untreated dental cavities, while they might hurt initially, they can stop hurting. They can turn into abscesses. They get into the neck and they can spread in the neck and close the airway. They can spread to vital organs. They can spread to the brain. You can actually have subacute bacterial endocarditis in your heart. You can have a brain abscess, they can be fatal. So that's why silver diamine fluoride is so important to stop the cavities, even if you haven't gotten to the point where, hey, I can, I can get things restored and fixed. Understand that these are bacterial diseases that everybody has. We usually get them from our mother. These are the bacteria involved and they feed on carbohydrate and sugar. So if you control diet, you can actually slow down the growth of cavities. That's why dentists keep saying, don't, don't have candidate. Candy, especially hard candy. Well, why? This is a blow up of a tooth and this is the groove in the tooth. And I want you to see that the hard candy gets packed down in this groove and that's where the decay starts. The toothbrush bristle is not small enough to clean out the groove. So even though brushing's great, this is why hard candy is so bad. Uh, I do want you to understand though that there are things we can do that are called sealants or preventive rest and resin restorations. And these things, I like to think of them as cheap insurance. They look like this when they've been done and you know, they don't last forever, they break off, but I think that they're very helpful and they're also quick and, and relatively easy to do. So you don't, have to, uh, you don't have to do any needles, you don't have to do anything like that. Uh, the red on the right is disclosing solution and your dentist can use this. You can actually get this and use it at home and it shows you where you're missing when you brush. And so you look at this tooth and you say, wow, now I see why there's a cavity on this tooth. So this is how you can clean out. This is what a dentist would do. This is a boot cap. You're learning what dentistry is. This used to be 
how we started fillings, but then we went further, went way down. And so if you went through the enamel and you went much deeper than this, you had to anesthetize the tube. Today, we know that we don't have to remove all of this, this stain. We don't have to get rid of all the bacteria. We would put silver diamine fluoride in here and then we would cover it up. And this is called minimally invasive dentistry. What's significant about it is it's fast and it's easy. It doesn't hurt. It can be done with a laser. You don't have to do a drill. There are a lot of things you can do today that make dentistry easier. And so it doesn't require anesthetic, doesn't hurt. So I think this is really important. This is called MID or minimally invasive dentistry. And this has been taught for the last probably 15 years in dental schools, but it's being more widely used now, especially for people with intellectual disability. Now, one of the most frustrating things about families is they'll go to a dentist and they'll get a quote and the quote will say, okay, we've got five fillings that we need. And for whatever reason, the family goes to another dentist, the, dentist, the next dentist comes back and says, no, I found 10. So what's going on there? Well, they're looking at those little grooves and they're making judgments on whether it should be filled or not, because it, it, it's a very slow moving disease process. And so this is really interesting. You can see this, this is IC DOS training. You can go online to this, and this is international training. And they, they actually showed, they took nine different dentists and they took the same 12 uh, group of 12 year old children and they asked them to count the number of teeth that had cavities and the number of teeth that were filled. And they didn't come up with the same numbers. They couldn't even count the fillings. Now that should sound discouraging to you as a parent, but it should also be reassuring to you that when you get multiple dentists looking at things differently, they're using their eyeballs, which are different and they're, able, and they're judging things differently. So what does it do? How do you look at the tube? Well, when you see this dark stain, you should say, ooh, that's not good. I don't like that. Well, it may indicate that the cavity started and stopped. It's called arrested, and it's down in the grooves. It may be active that somebody put SDF on it. It may be deeper than it looks, and it needs an x-ray. It may need a filling. Maybe it's too deep for a sealant. Maybe not. Maybe a preventive resin restoration where you don't need anesthetic, but you need to drill a little bit deeper, maybe like with a laser. It's not likely to cause pain and not likely to, for the cuts to break in a situation like this, okay? But again, you can't just look alone. You have to uh, take usually an x-ray of some type. Now, there are some other ways to image besides x-rays today. So where technology is really changing the way that we operate in the industry. Now, this is really interesting. So if you look at this slide on the right, these are teeth that need to be filled. On the left, they don't need to be fill, filled because they're not below the enamel. Now, we look at these teeth and we judge them based upon, as dentists, what we're seeing. So you as a family member can look and say, oh, okay, that looks more like a cavity that could be treated with something to seal it. Or maybe here, nothing needs to be done. And this is why you get different estimates of different dentists. This is also at the IC DOS thing, and it's, it really shows clearly the progressions of decay. And so the first, uh, the zero to three, uh, they're really not into, they're not into the dentin until they get to this three, okay? And so when you get to four is when you're gonna have to have anesthetic, all right? So that's really important to know. Well. These are extracted teeth that have been cut. And so they kind of show us what a tooth looks like. This outer part is the enamel. The inner part is dentin. The inner part has nerve endings. That's why when you drill on an animal, you don't feel anything. There's no nerve endings. You get deep, you feel something. And then this different place here is called the pulp chamber. This is the hollow part in the middle of the tooth where the tooth has its blood vessels and nerve tissue. And in this case, you can see that the cavity started here and you can see right at the junction between the enamel and the dentin, really the bacteria are taking off. They're really uh, multiplying rapidly. And you see that they're shooting down these little tubes. These are called dental tubules. And they've gotten all the way to the pulp chamber and the pulp has reacted by creating the pulp stone. And so there's inflammation to the, to, in this tooth. This is an extracted tooth where we looked at it after we you know, extracted it and we could see what's going on. Let me show you two other teeth. This is why it's so difficult sometimes to diagnose correctly. These are extracted teeth. This is a tooth with decay. And you can see that the decay does not go through the enamel. This is slow moving, not progressing, maybe arrested. You put silver diamine fluoride on it, you probably don't do anything. And you can see it's not affecting the rest of the tooth. 
this is a similar looking tooth and you see that doesn't look a whole lot different. But look what's going on inside the tooth. This is why x-rays are needed. You can't tell just by looking at the tooth itself. Please understand that. And so what's all the buzz about minimally invasive dentistry? Well, we've just got a lot more tools in our toolkit. We've got, like I mentioned, silver diamine fluoride, air abrasion, lasers. There's a thing called atraumatic restorative therapy and pin fist sealants. Not all dentists agree on this. Remember, uh, the older the dentist, they might not have been trained in this. And they might believe that they've got to remove every bit of the decay. And that's why you might have one dentist that wants to charge you more and do more fillings and another dentist that says, hey, we're going to do more preventive things. So understanding that fixing teeth is the old way we used to do it. And these are what dentists are taught in dental schools as to whether or not to fill a tooth. Okay. So I'm giving you, this is basic dental boot camp to, that, so you can communicate with your dentist in a much more clear way. Understand that your overall health is related to your oral health. A lot of us know a lot about Crater Willie. We know a lot of, of what goes on with occlusion and nutrition. And so we need to get a health team that is interrelated. We need to have dentists who understand bruxism, grinding of the teeth at night, and sleep apnea. We know that people with Down syndrome tend to have high, much higher rates of sleep apnea and swallowing disorders and GERD, which is that uh, gastric reflex that comes up into the esophagus. We know that a lot of times dental experience is called post-traumatic stress. So if you have a, a bad experience in one dental office, you almost always have to change the environment. You can't go back to that place. And so chronic infections are related. I talked earlier about uh, cardiac disease, uh, periodontal disease, and diabetes. These are all interactive. So a new policy is needed. So what's happened in dentistry is the American Dental Association last year changed the code of conduct and said, no longer can you tell people, I can't treat you because of your disability. That is no longer accepted under the ADA code of conduct. And the additional thing that happened is the Commission on Dental Accreditation said, hey, we've got to teach dentists how to work on people with intellectual disabilities throughout the lifespan. That just happened. So you're not going to see the impact for 10 more years. So what are we going to have to do? We've got to change continuing education. We've got to get out and help dentists that are in practice say, okay, how do I help this person? And what I'm trying to promote is the idea that you don't just send people to the dentist and sedate them or restrain them. There's a better way. And the better way is an incremental model where we gradually retrain our dentists, retrain our dental team, and retrain our families, and ultimately make it easier and more fun for people to get their, their uh, dental met. Understanding that under federal law, you have a right to dental care. And most people don't realize that, and I'm going to show you in a little bit. So there is a better way of doing this. I'd encourage you to, to go online to the AADMD.org, the American Academy of Developmental Medicine and Dentistry. Uh, they are the partner with Special Olympics. They're the clinical arms uh, of Special Olympics. And I've, at the end of this slide, the slides, I've got their contact information. Uh, we're teaching how to have facilities without walls, how to do more in-home dentistry, healthcare delivery at lower cost, and giving people and families control versus the old way, which we call the medical model, where we used to tell you what to do. The other thing we're talking to people about is incremental care. Uh, the AADMD has the Exceptional Parent Magazine, which uh, is free. I'd encourage families to get online and uh, start paying attention to Exceptional Parent Magazine. A lot of good articles, practical articles in it. The federal law that you should know about says that under the Bill of Rights and the DD Act of 2000, that it requires appropriate and sufficient medical and dental care. Just putting it into law doesn't make it happen. And so we're really happy that AADMD has actually worked closely with the ADA. We've got dental education changing. Uh, we're seeing a lot of things. This was NYU's dental school in, in New York City. They started a special needs clinic. Special needs clinics are not the answer. The answer is for every dentist in the United States to be able to treat a person with special needs. The special needs clinics in the dental schools is where we're teaching it. But I thought what was interesting about this New York Times article was the comments from the families on the article. And so Tony said, you know, a little patience and one step at a time approach is the way to go. Wow. Rachel said, you know, it used to be a problem. And then we found a dentist that would work with us. And, and the first few times he just sat in the chair and slowly built up his tolerance to an examine cleaning. That's what I call about, that's what I refer to as a scavenger hunt. You don't have to do that on the regular day so that the dentist loses money when his staff is there ready to work. You do it when they're not there 
or a staff member can volunteer to come in and give a and help with the scavenger hunt. You've got to partner with a dentist and find a dentist that's willing. But you see that this was really this really worked. And Paul said, "Look, we were told that our our son could only get care under sedation. We found another dentist that took the time, and even though the first session didn't go good, after a few sessions he he enjoyed it. So what does that tell you? That tells you this dentist." knew that importance of making it fun. Well, what's making it fun? Making it fun is that I care about you as a person. I'm not, I'm not motivated to try to put my fingers in your personal space, in your mouth. But I really want to build a bond of trust. If your dentist and the dental team doesn't understand how to build a bond of trust, it's not going to work. And I'm telling you the best way to do this is incrementally starting in the home, really doing it gradually over a period of time. Now, there are times that you get an emergency and you're going to have to have sedation. There are times that happens, but I would say the vast majority of the times you can stop this. Uh, understand that baby teeth uh, really decay much faster than adult teeth, and giving kids candy can result in disastrous consequences. We can stop it with silver diamine fluoride. This is an example of how we had a cavity on an adult with intellectual disability. We used a laser. It only took about a minute to do what I just did. So you see the cavity, we got to there, and there's the filling. And you go, wow, I don't even see it. Well, there it is. So it's the same tooth. And it really works fast and it's easy. So these are the new techniques. These are the new tool, tools in the toolbox. You need to find a dentist that knows how to do all of these things. And if they don't, are they willing to learn? Is their dental team willing to work? Get a group of families that find dentists. And can you connect your dentist to your, to your physician? So these are the things that I would want you to learn. Gum disease, a lot of people don't realize that pink gums are healthy and the redness is bad. And so when you look at these, the redness in between the teeth, this shows a person brushing pretty good, but not flossing, okay? Dilatin hyperplasia, it can be really bad. You can talk to your um, neurologist and say, could we use Tegretol? If not, there's things that the dentist neurologist should do together to try to keep this under control. Chlorhexidine is really good, but it stains the teeth yellow. And yeah, you can get the yellow stain off. It's not easy. I think before the visit, having a form that you fill out and we can share this online, it's actually been published in the Exceptional Parent Magazine, but there's an article about it. But I, the dental visit pre-appointment form, very helpful to your dentist. Because a family need to say, way before I get there, what's going on? And then you said, come to my house, interview the dental team. If they're not interested, find another dentist. Is a person verbal or nonverbal? How do they communicate? How do they communicate pleasure? They need to know before you set up an appointment what to expect. Understand there's local anesthesia, oral medication, IM sedation and IV sedation and general anesthesia. And these cost increasingly more money. They also have increasing risk. And so what I'm teaching you today is a way to do dentistry without anesthesia. It doesn't work 100% of the time, but it works a lot of the time. And we really need to get better. What's immobilization? That's a fancy word for restraint. And a lot of dentists, this is what they were taught to do. And so if you do this, you're going to create psychological a trauma. And I would, I would tell you that the only time to consider this is if it's emergency health need today that you have to do it. An example would be somebody who fell down, they hit their face, they broke their two front teeth, their mouth's bleeding. You got to take an x-ray, stop the bleeding. That's when a restraint's appropriate. Too many times dentists will jump and use it because it makes them more money for them to bill for procedures. The goal is for us to have healthy mouths and learn to be good patients. There's a lot of different things that we need to work for as advocates to get adult dental benefits. We also need to figure, understand how to use the ISP or the IEP to get a behavioralist involved and make oral health goals a part of the behavioral plan. This is a way outside of dentistry that you can pay for things that help you get what I'm talking about today. So a lot of times it means you've got to educate your case manager or whoever is in responsible for the individualized service plan or the individualized education plan if it's in a school. So the idea is, can it be done? Yes. Do they believe it can be done? Maybe not. You're going to have to be an advocate, just like all families always have been. Can we achieve this? I think, yes, you've got to be a partner. You've got to find your dental assistant. Some dental assistants can actually be employed by the ARC or they can be employed by a UCP or a, a local community provider to do, to do basic care. And the dental assistant can also be building a bond of trust and that's outside of the dental office. What, we, what you have to do then is get the collaboration of a DD provider 
to somebody that gets paid by the waiver, the home and community-based waiver program. For those states like Texas that have long wait lists of 20 years, it's a, it's a sad thing. A lot of states don't have wait lists, so that's changing. The oral health care delivery system is very complex. It's This is what we mean by facility without walls. And we basically, we say we can start in home. We can do x-rays and cleanings, a lot of portable care. You've got to get your dental home team together. And so you as a family can be the glue that holds everybody together. Understand when you do that, you're going to improve overall health. Oral health is connected to overall health. You can read these later and you can share this, uh, these slides with your dentist. So these are made available to you through Moving Mountains. And I really want to thank you guys for the opportunity to show all this. And uh, I'm going to open it for questions. I think this is an example of as dentists, we asked everybody to do the same thing. Come into our dental office, sit down and be quiet. And that doesn't work for everybody. So we have to adapt. This is what I call a transformation to health. And the bottom line is to use trust of the person and the family. And then these are some good resources for you. And that's all I've got. So I'll quit sharing my screen. Thank you for listening.